Reptiles took to the water pretty soon after they evolved. Over this many hundred million year history of the scaly beasts adapting to a life at sea, plenty evolved super long necks. This happened multiple times independently across wildly unrelated lineages. Despite the evolutionary success of this strategy, proven by how many times it evolves, such a long ass neck would be super easy for a big mouthed badass ocean hunter to slice right through. It leaves the animal vulnerable. At least, that's what you might expect just from looking at animals like this. Despite this seeming weakness, evidence of predators slicing through those long necks has never really been found. One of the first groups to develop these long necks were the Tanistrophians, a moderately diverse group of Triassic archosauromorphs. These guys were living it up across Europe, Asia, North America, and possibly South America, which was easy back then because the continents were all smooshed together. The biggest and longest necked of these guys was the group's namesake, Tanistrophius. This critter has four known species from Eurasia and North America. The largest of these animals reached 6 meters, or 20 feet in length, with most of that length being the neck. Speaking of that neck, the Tanistrophids, like the Ashtarkid pterosaurs and the mammalian giraffes, evolved their neck the easy way by elongating the individual vertebrae that make up the neck, rather than increasing the number of bones, as in the dinosaurs and the plesiosaurs. Despite the comparison I just made, this neck, made up of 13 vertebrae and struts, is unique among the tetrapod animals. It was probably stiffened and used to catch prey through an ambush strategy, though the precise nature of the neck and what it meant for the habits of these animals has remained a debate for well over a century. However, that's not what I'm here today to teach you. A brand new study by Stephen Speakman and Udal Muhal, published in Cell Press in July of 2023, describes a pair of Tanistrophius specimens that died from decapitation. The specimens, PIMUZT2819, of the Tanistrophius hydroides species, and PIMUZT3901 of the Tanistrophius longobardicus species, were found in the Middle Triassic Marine Lagostata of Monte San Giorgio. According to the paper's own words, both preserve a complete skull and an incomplete neck column, which abruptly ends at a distinct break in a vertebra and its ribs. The fractures of the broken vertebrae of both specimens are generally oblique and spiral, and they display smooth surfaces, which pretty much means these were fractures made on fresh bones at or shortly after death. In other words, the predator could have decapitated the animals after it had already killed them, or it was directly what did it. Specimen PIMUZ T2819 only possesses bite traces, composed of two punctures and a score mark, on the 10th vertebra, right next to the break. The punctures are aligned and accompany the broken section of the neck, suggesting that they are directly related to the decapitating bite. This bite caused a major fracture within the vertebra, which formed a large V-shaped bone splinter. The score, positioned on the V-shaped splinter, is not directly aligned with these other bite traces, suggesting a prior bite in the same region of the vertebra. Based on the posteriorly widening score, the movement of the tooth tracing the bone was backwards with respect to the vertebra. After grasping the neck, the predator pulled back, as observed in certain reptilian predators. Considering the back and upwards displaced V-shaped splinter and the broken posterior end of the dorsal puncture, the neck was most likely bitten from above and the rear. Thus, from this angle, the neck of PIMUZ2819 was bitten at least twice in close succession, with the final bite severing the neck. As the paper continues, the nature of the break in the seventh vertebra in the other specimen, PIMUZT3901, with splintering of the bone, indicates that this neck was also severed by a violent bite. In addition, an oval pit on the top and side of the back part of the fifth vertebra and corresponding breakage of the ribs clearly suggests this part of the neck was also bitten, possibly representing an initial attack, with the predator coming from above as in the other PIMUZT2819 specimen. 
While the fractures observed on the broken vertebrae resemble those occurring on fresh bones from violent impact, the rest of the specimens remained intact, only showing decay features occurring in low energetic conditions, like a lagoon or high saline environment. Although differentiating between predation and scavenging in the fossil record is notoriously difficult, I'm looking at you, T-Rex, several features support the former interpretation. Typical indications of scavenging, such as disarticulation plus scattering and destruction of elements, as well as numerous bite traces on bones, are all absent. Instead, all elements, including the delicate ribs, remain intact, being only broken in association with the bite traces. On top of that, well-defined punctures inflicted by large predators that completely pierce the bone, as in the PIMUZ T2819 specimen, are often associated with predatory behaviors rather than scavenging. The predators most likely fed on the body behind the severed neck, which would have provided considerable nutrients contrary to the slender neck and head with barely any meat on the bone. The neck is severed near the back end of the 10th vertebra in PIMUZ T2819 and at the base of the 7th vertebra in PIMUZ T3901. In both Tanistrophia species, neck vertebrae 7 to 10 are the longest, representing the midsection of the neck. This region was probably pre-real estate for predator jaws, since it's far enough away from the head but right before the thicker base of the neck. The recurring decapitation in the midsection of the neck in Tanistrophius might tell you that predators preferred to target this area, but such an hypothesis remains tentative since there are only two specimens that show this occurring. Many predators could have inflicted the trauma to the comparatively small PIMUZ T3901 specimen, including a medium-sized marine reptile or a predatory fish with pointy teeth. A similar scenario was hypothesized for the holotype of Macrocnemis obristi, a similar sized tanistrophid with a severed torso coming from rocks of a similar age from a similar region. Fewer predators could have produced enough force to decapitate the bigger PIMUZ T2819 specimen. Among the sufficiently large aquatic and terrestrial predators known from Monte San Giorgio, the 14.5 mm distance between the two punctures only corresponds to the known tooth spacing in the predatory marine reptiles Nothosaurus giganteus, Symbospondylus buxeri, and Helveticosaurus zollingeri. As a result, the attack most likely occurred underwater, corresponding to a predominantly aquatic lifestyle inferred for Tanistrophius hydroides. But an attack from a terrestrial predator shouldn't be completely ruled out either, as there were very large landlubbers of Archosaurian origin at the time. Decapitation of both specimens helps corroborate the idea that the slender neck was a weak spot for predators. Perhaps Tanistrophius minimized encounters with larger predators by preferring to live near the bottom of shallow aquatic environments and areas with limited visibility, also maximizing its own ambush-based predator strategy. Despite being represented by a wealth of specimens and achieving similar neck elongation, there is no unambiguous evidence for predatory targeting of long necks among the plesiosaurs. That's about all there is for this prehistoric cold case. Let me know which other fossil murderers you want me to cover. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.
Mm-hmm.